morning today, our guest is Dr. Mirav Ozer. Hello, Dr. Mirav Ozer. Please tell us a little about yourself. You are a great expert. Uh, yeah, uh, my name is Dr. Mirav Ozer, and I'm a blockchain expert, one of the leading in the world, uh, worldwide. And I'm also a professor, a fintech professor at Rutgers Business School. Um, I've been very much into very much deep into blockchain, cryptocurrency, NFTs, DAO, DeFi, and all that, uh, that uh, um, the metaverse uh, as well in this space for almost seven years and so maybe more. And um, that's my expertise. Yes, Dr. Merav. So I've been reading your articles published by NASDAQ and I said, I must interview this academic because I'm interested in business and finance and you have a wealth of knowledge. Dr. Ozer, what is the blockchain? Well, I mean, uh, the, the best way to describe uh, blockchain, I mean, I know they know that in, in a very simplistic way, you could say that blockchain is basically a ledger, but it sounds really like a regular ledger. It's uh, an immutable ledger, meaning that it cannot be changed, altered, uh, deleted. So whatever is created on the blockchain lives there forever and ever and ever and ever unlike any other ledger whether you think about uh, SQL um, database or, or, or your, your file in Excel. So that's, you know, it, um, what do you think about? It? More than that, you, when we're thinking about, about this type of ledger, this, is, this ledger is decentralized, meaning that everyone has access to it. So unlike any other ledger, whether it's your Excel or anything else, where it is centralized, meaning only you and maybe some other people within your organization has, act, has, has access to it. This one, everyone has access to it from anywhere around the world. Uh, as long as you have the access to an internet, then it doesn't matter where you are, whether you are on, a, on, the, on top of the Himalaya or taking a trip to Alaska, then uh, as long as you have internet connections, you can tap into it. So this is in a very, very simplistic and broad way of how you think about the blockchain. Dr. Ozer, mm -hmm. what's a cryptocurrency? Well, a cryptocurrency is a currency that, that is created uh, in, I mean, that the native, every blockchain has a native currency that, that helps it uh, uh, basically um, that um, enables the, the usage of, of the blockchain in terms of the validation and the reward system for the validators. So every, every blockchain has its native cryptocurrency and Bitcoin, that same name for, for I think it's the only blockchain that, that the cryptocurrency, the native currency and its blockchain itself has the same name, which is Bitcoin. Ethereum, for example, as ETH, et cetera. But that cryptocurrency, which is the native currency, which is created on the blockchain, has all the features. I mean, it cannot be counterfeited, cannot be, you cannot do any double spending and everything. Uh, it is a cryptographic crypto a currency and that lives and being created on the blockchain. It enables all the transactions within this ecosystem of this particular blockchain. And because of that, it has all the features that I just mentioned before that comes with the blockchain. Why was crypto created in the first place? Do we know why? Yes. I mean, if you think about it, Bitcoin was the first cryptocurrency of, of the first blockchain that has been created. Uh, I mean, was I mean there were all kinds of attempts, you know, in the '90s, but they, I mean, I guess technology hasn't been there yet in order for that to really been able to uh, create the the blockchain ecosystem that we have today. But the first one was launched was Bitcoin, which I like to call it like the first use case for blockchain. And uh, this um, and, and Bitcoin was was launched in uh, January of beginning of January two thousand and nine. And if you think about it, what happened then? It was just after the financial crisis, just after the big bailout of the banks and the riots that we had, you know, uh, you know occupied the Wall Street, if you remember, uh, and all of that. If you remember all of those, uh, you know, resist, I mean, outrage that we, that the public had because of what was happening with the financial crisis and, and the, the bailout of, of the big banks, et cetera. 
And that system was created, if you think about what is the blockchain. A blockchain is basically peer-to-peer -peer and that's the Bitcoin was the first blockchain, the first decentralized system blockchain, uh, which was, uh, uh, and Bitcoin is, is a payment system, a peer-to-peer -peer system, meaning that it is decentralized, meaning that there's no intermediaries, no, all these transactions are happening peer-to-peer -peer with no interference of any central banks, government, uh, uh, banks, um, uh, etc. So it's for the people, by the people. That's the premise of what blockchain is. That's the premise of what Bitcoin was supposed to be, a peer-to-peer -peer payment. And from there, you know, right, we got in the way and I wrote about it, many a few articles about that. And it became like a commodity, but that was not the reason. The reason was to create a peer-to-peer -peer system, a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer system, and the power of a blockchain, which I hope we're going to come back to it, and I can see that probably in the executive order that is coming out, at least in some ways, um, they're alluding to financial inclusion because it does have the power to democratize society. Bitcoin, Algorand, I like to follow cryptocurrencies, but despite the tremendous success of cryptocurrencies, some analysts continue to argue that cryptocurrency is not a feasible long-term investment. Is this an accurate representation? I'm, I'm not talking about, the, about cryptocurrency in terms of investment. I'm talking about blockchain and the technology. You have to separate them. There are two different things. There's the technology, which I'm um, great uh, believer in that and bullish on that. And even JP Morgan, if you think about it, they, Jamie Diamond always said, you know, he believes in the technology and, and they, in fact, the bank has its own uh, uh, division, which is called Onyx, which is all about you know, creating, uh, you know, projects uh, or, or blockchain project. And there's the cryptocurrency itself, but the cryptocurrency does not supposed, was not supposed to be an investment. Not by any means. Okay, but if you follow investment, obviously you're going to see a lot of articles on cryptocurrency. Yes, but I'm explaining to you that Bitcoin, I just mentioned why Bitcoin was launched. It was launched because of the premise of creating a peer-to-peer -peer payment system. It was not launched because the idea was to create an investment. Yes. The fact that grid got in the way and people started to invest on, in that, on that, that's a different story. It's like telling me that Apple is a, an investment. No, Apple is a company. It has a real product. There are two different things. Yes. Yes, I, I get your point cl clearly, but I, I, I just wanted you to comment on the investment landscape re relating to Bitcoin because you're, you're also an expert in the arena of crypto legislation. Right. So what, what do you want me to comment yeah. exactly? No, I was asked because er, earlier I was saying that some analysts are still betting against investments in crypto. So I was asking if this is an accurate assessment of the investment landscape. Well, I don't want to, I don't want to give uh, investment advice, definitely not in, in this uh, media uh, or on here. I mean, so it's a bit, I don't want to give any investment advice. As I said, I'm bullish on the technology. I cannot give you a specific advice whether to invest in Bitcoin or Algorand or Ethereum. This is not what I'm going to talk about. You have to assess each and every technology because each and every cryptocurrency has a technology, a use case, an economic use case behind it. And the way that you are assessing any investment of anything, whether you want to invest in Apple, or you want to invest in Google, or you want to invest in, um, uh, I don't know, GameStop or whatever you want to invest in, you're doing your due diligence. Same here. There is a use case behind it. It's not just, you know, a volatility of something that goes up and down. You have to understand the use case. You have to understand what this technology does. You have to understand what's behind it. And there is, I mean, of course, you have to be a little bit more of a technical person also to read the protocols and the, and the, and the consensus mechanism and everything to understand it and understand whether there, there is something viable within the ecosystem that makes sense for that use business use case to do. So it's a technology that you have to analyze. You have to analyze the business use case behind it. 
and put them put them all together and say okay this is something that is valuable and if not then probably this uh, will not last for long but you have to analyze it diligently like any other investment dr ozir big crypto cryptocurrency Early in discussion, mm -hmm. you were explaining to us why the blockchain was created and why crypto was created. What, right. what are the implications of crypto for the average man? Well, as I said, in, uh, I am a great, believe, uh, great believer of the technology. And the, this technology has the power, really, if it is utilized correctly, to democratize society. It's all about financial inclusion. Look about what's happening in the Philippines. Look about what's happening now in the Ukraine. People who do not have any access to financial services, traditional financial services, like banks, etc., they can tap, they can create their own wallet and, and have all these you know, financial services uh, via uh, crypto. And that's what happens in the Philippines. Philippines, and now we see that also in Ukraine, we call it the mother of all adoption. I mean, necessity is the mother of all adoption. You see that you know, in the Philippines, they started adopting that a few years ago, and almost every 7-Eleven in the Philippines has a crypto ATM. And the reason is because most of them don't have access into the traditional financial system. Most of them, uh, a lot of them, not most of them, but a lot of them, work abroad and then they have to send money to the families. How can they do that if they don't have access to a bank? So they do that through wallets of crypto wallets. So this is how they are able to sustain themselves financially. And that's the power of financial inclusion and democracy and the, the to, and the democratization of society in a big way. Dr. Ozir, when we talk about crypto regulation, what mm -hmm. exactly is being regulated? Explain it for us. Well, I mean, the regulators are trying to rub their head against how to regulate that. Is that a security? Is that uh, um, uh, currency? Uh, is that, a, um, um, will it be a, um, a legal tender um, or not? Will it be a payment uh, methods like what they do in Japan? It's not a legal tender, but it's a payment method. Uh, El Salvador is regarding it as the legal tender. So the question is how exactly in some cases it might fall uh, under securities law, because you know if it is tokenized and some, because crypto can be a lot of things, it could be a payment, it could be something that is um, like a, a tokenization mechanism for let's say uh, functionalizing real estate. So it all depends on what the use case is. And I'm, and, and I'm working now with NATO, which is International Association for trusted blockchain application, we just put forward uh, a few uh, policy notes, uh, proposals to the EU Commission, the European Commission, exactly on this regulation on how to regulate everything that has to do with cryptocurrency and DAO and NFTs and uh, DeFi, centralized finance. So it's all about, okay, under how do we need to create new regulations? Or can we use the same regulation in some cases? Uh, um, under the umbrella of the of the of the regulations that already exist, so that's what I mean. People are I mean, what regulators are trying to understand is uh, it, it goes um, uh, anything like you know banning it, like in the case of of uh, China, for example, or sometimes and and India. Um, but why would you ban something like that? I mean, it has merit, and I think we will find a way, like what Europe is trying to do. And what Japan is trying to do in Singapore and other places is to understand what are each and every, because it's not like one, um, uh, one size fits all because it has many use cases. And according to these use cases, we'll decide whether it's all. All right then. Dr. Ozir, mm -hmm. what are DOAs? It's the uh, DAOs. Yes. Decentralized Autonomous Organization. And is that what you mean? Yes, yes. And what exactly is the function of such an organization or platform? So if you think about a DAO, the best analogy that I can give you, it's like, think about like a call. 
right? You probably know what the co-op is. A co-op is basically, if you think about it, it's it's, it's um, um, a member member driven uh, of, um, uh, uh, association or institution. I mean, we see that a lot in New York City when you have uh, um, buildings, you know, that are co-ops. So what does it mean? You know, we have the tenants, you know, the community that is voting uh, for all kinds of uh, 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 things that they want to do within that building, whether they're going to hire uh, um, a new gardener, or they're going to fix the boiler or things like that. So the community is making together voting for any um, anything that is happening within that community. That's what the co-op is. And something that started in way back in hundreds of years ago in, in, uh, in Europe and especially in the UK. So this is how we can think about um, uh, a DAO, which is basically a self-governing type of organization that uh, the members vote together and decide about what to do with their community. They decide that not you know, the government or some rules and some regulations, but they will vote on. Uh, and of course, you know, the, the DAO itself will have its own, you know, policies or regulations to say, you know, how, to, how the voting is, is, it, it, it takes place and how much of the majority that you need, it will say, you know, who, who can vote and who cannot vote and how they are rewarded. But there's also a reward mechanism here because this is a platform that, you know, trying to um, incentivize people to to take part in, in, and participate in this, in, in this voting and take part in this community. And that's uh, the mechanism. I like the idea of the DAO because I call it faceless governance because it's even better than a co because in this case, you don't go to um, you know, a, 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 a room and, and you see people voting and everyone can see each other. And you know, sometimes they don't uh, feel that they are capable uh, to really make their own um, true uh, vote, but here because it's on the blockchain and all what they know is your address and they don't know anything about you from gender to uh, to age to um, uh, to race to nationality to whatever. So all what they see is, 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 is I think this is why I like that idea because this is as I call this is a true way to really govern because that's a really faceless governance and everyone can really cast the vote truthfully. And I'm very much an advocate for that. And I believe that we're going to see it more and more everywhere, in every, in every system. Yes, a, it's, it's quite a concept. But now we're going to transition to the meat of the matter, non-fungible tokens. What's mm -hmm. a non-fungible token? Uh, well, uh, non-fungible tokens, you know, I, the, the, the idea of fungible versus non-fungible has been around since the beginning of time. So let's first understand what is fungible versus non-fungible. So fungible is everything that is intertangible, like, you know, uh, a dollar bill. You can take care of your dollar bill and it doesn't matter which dollar bill you use in order to buy your coffee at Starbucks. Uh, but uh, something that is non-fungible is something that is unique and something that um, is not interchangeable. So everything that you can perceive as unique, whether it's a piece of art, whether even the video, or, or uh, I mean, even this video, so it's, it, everything is unique. So uh, whatever you can perceive as unique, that's basically non-fungible. And that's in the physical world. In the tokenization world, if you think about fungible, then Bitcoin is the equivalent of this $1. It's tangible, it doesn't matter you know, which between you use, but it does it doesn't mean that it's not a, um, uh, it is uh, interchangeable, but it's, but it's not uh, indistinguishable because, you know, like uh, with the doll bill, it has a serial number, which can also has some kind of serial number for, for simplicity hash. Um, but uh, so that's uh, interchangeable and fungible. Non fungible is. Could be digital could be you can take any digital or physical asset and you can digitize it uh, and create a certificate of authentication via an nft and that's uh non-fungible token dr ozer why would someone want to own a nft in the first place why would you want to own the mona lisa because it's valuable. 
<laughs> yes, yeah, I, I get I get where you're going. <laughs> yeah, the Mona Lisa is a valuable painting. Yeah, but as I'm saying, you know, you're creating something that is unique. Everyone has, I mean, there's a marketplace of what is unique. It's a marketplace for collectible. Why would you want to own like a baseball court? For sentimental values and to brag that you own it. Yeah, so same idea. Non fungible token, but an another question. And and can in a non fungible token be owned by many people at the same time? Yes, but you have to be careful with that because if you are, it, yes, it can be you know like hundred people coming together and buying this, buying this one, that's fine. But if you start tokenizing it and factionalizing it, then it might fall under security law. So you have to be very careful. With that. I read an article recently about a young man from Malaysia. He's not a celebrity, but he was mm -hmm. posting photos of, of himself on social media and mm -hmm. the NFT became really successful. Mm -hmm. and, okay. I, and I was saying to myself, okay, this is just an average person. He's not famous, but I guess people appreciated what he was doing and they liked the allure of the action. That's why they were investing in that particular non-fungible token so this question is not an academic question it's really a gimmick could we obviously we could create an nft for the show i've been thinking about that for some time yes, not, yes, <laughs> yes. i mean this is not a theoretical uh i mean i'm working on something similar i'm actually experimenting now with audios NFT Be audios. because okay so i'm a researcher and you're an academic and uh, creatives like celebrities they are capitalizing on the nft craze but what about people like me and you well we can create one also i mean the way that i see it if you read my article what i wrote about i believe that everyone will be able to create um, uh, another stream of income with NFTs, because instead of, you know, if you have like a cute videos of your puppy, or you have a uh, video like this, I mean, audio, like of, 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 of an interview, or you have, a, uh, I don't know, you have a hobby and you exercise and you want to share it with the world, instead of just posting it on Facebook or YouTube, you can monetize it by creating your NFT and then monetize it. All right, then. And we, we didn't discuss this earlier, but how is an, a non-fungible token created? What are the steps? Well, you have to go through some steps. I mean, uh, it depends on you know, which uh, um, you know, uh, blockchain you use. You can create it on, um, on uh, uh, Ethereum, on Algorand. And you have to you know if either you can create from scratch if you are a developer. Uh, that um, you need a little bit of, uh, and then you, you have, to, uh, you, then you have much more flexibility to create whatever rules you want. Uh, and then uh, you create it via a smart contract because it's a talk, uh, uh, um, fungible, an unfungible token is basically a smart contract, which you can have all kinds of rules that are attached to that, where the creator can own it, uh, uh, any royalty uh, kickback, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you can either do that, or you can go to, um, let's say marketplaces like OpenSea, and then you can just follow their rules and um, create that on top of uh, the platform. But you have to be careful. Whatever you have on on OpenSea stays on uh, OpenSea, and also you have to um, follow their own guidelines and whatever fees that they charge, etc. Dr. Ozier, so I read your article titled "Non Fungible Tokens: Looking Beyond the Hype." And in, uh -huh. the, in this article, you refer to block bar. What is block bar? So block bar is a company that created a platform. And the, the, the platform uh, is basically that they have a physical, physical, uh, um, very expensive liquor that sits in a warehouse in Singapore. I mean, all this, you know, I'm, I'm not, I mean, don't get, don't, you know, uh, um, try to, 
ask you too much about, about liquor and, and all of that because I'm not an expert of that. So I didn't know exactly their value, but I do know that there are some collectors of special liquor that, you know, their bottles of funds to as as much as, you know, $100,000, $200,000. I, but again, don't ask me about that. That's not, that's not my expertise. Uh, but those expensive ones, and uh, what they created, they took you know each and every physical bottle and they created a certificate, an NFT, because the power of NFTs is basically the authentication. So you can authenticate anything from, from a physical asset to a digital asset. In this case, they authenticate the physical asset. So each and every bottle has the, the certificate of authentication, the NFTs. And this NFT is, is created on the blockchain. And now, basically what you created is a liquidity mechanism how you can trade and be through this uh, buy or sell, uh, I mean, uh, these uh, bottles. And this transaction can happen from, from, for, for, I mean, theoretically speaking, for years until someone cracks the bottle. And this, this, this is something that was not be able, you, I mean, theoretically speaking, you could have done before, uh, but you know, how can you authenticate but you're just buying the own shape of a bottle that you don't really have it in your living room uh, or on your dining table. So how can you authenticate something like that? I mean, yeah, you can go to notaries and lawyers, et cetera, et cetera, but that's, you know, very cumbersome and this is why it's never been done. But through a blockchain, through creating a certificate of authentication on, 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 the, um, uh, on the blockchain, uh, that's a really, that's a use case that can really facilitate all this kind of transaction worldwide. And that's an interesting uh, concept. Do you know what's interesting, Dr. Ozier, and you're going to comment more on it, real estate and the internet? How are NFTs transforming virtual real estate? What is virtual real estate? Virtual real estate is basically something like the central end, for example. So you you have, and that's, you know, when we're going to move eventually, and I do believe that that's going to happen to the metaverse, then all these virtual spaces uh, are basically real estate, real estate, some kind of real estate. So they are those decentralized, uh, central end, for example, this is basically each and every parcel they have about oh, over 90,000 uh, virtual parcels and the parcel is basically an NFT. Why? Because if you think about it, if you have a physical uh, land, then you have to authenticate it. How do you authenticate the ID, right? Or title. So how are you going to do that in the digital world, in the metaverse world? You have to authenticate it. How do we authenticate that via NFT? So each and every parcel, each and every unit is an NFT. And this is what we have in this digital world. And I, and uh, just uh, about uh, a few weeks ago, JP Morgan, the big banks, the largest banks in the US just uh, purchased um, a parcel in, uh, in Decentraland and they are basically getting ready to the metaverse uh, era where they can, they, because they do believe that that's gonna happen. Dr. Ozier, can we truly regulate the metaverse? I don't know. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, I mean the same way that we are trying to regulate the uh, blockchain and cryptocurrency um, ecosystem, and blockchain and, and 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 a lot of things, you know, and the blockchain is, is technology that will enable uh, the metaverse to exist and scale. So basically by you know, regulating everything to do with blockchain, you somewhat regulate the metaverse. So there will be some issues with privacy and security. And I think that will go somehow through the blockchain because that will be the way for us to take care of all the security and privacy and other issues that relates to the metaverse. So yeah, it's, it, it will be part of it. So we're talking about NFTs, the, the, block, the blockchain and finance. However, usually when we write or discuss NF, NFTs, we talk about the creative sectors. What are the implications for finance? I don't understand your question. No. So NFTs, we discuss NFTs within the, con within the context of creativity. 
So celebrities, new dogs, etc. You listed an example in one of your articles. But in terms of banking and finance and the international capital markets, do NFTs have, have any value at that level? Yes, I mean, uh, I mean, it, it. I mean, there's another concept which is called DeFi, which is decentralized finance. I mean, how everything is going to be uh, facilitated in all this new era of the metaverse. It all has to come through uh, DeFi, which is decentralized finance. Um, this is how you connect between the physical world and the, and the, the physical, uh, the sorry, the physical world the, um, and the digital world and the virtual world. And NFTs, if you think about it, let's say this parcel. This parcel is the way to authenticate that that's NFT, right? And all these NFTs, uh, so now you can take this parcel and you can uh, and use it as a collateral for um, whether it's a, or for a loan, a business loan, whether it's a business loan in your physical world or in your virtual world. So NFTs can be part of this ecosystem of this new DeFi ecosystem. Br brilliant works and, and ideas ahead. So Dr. Ozir, what are you working on presently? I know you're always researching. I'm, I'm working on uh, different, uh, uh, different project. I'm working on an NFT project, uh, which has to do with uh, building platforms for, uh, for artists uh, in, in, in build, building new uh, business models. Uh, to for them to be able to monetize to really have control over the creation while monetizing it in perpetuity. So this is one uh, experiment, uh, one uh, one project I'm working on. I'm also working on a project of uh, understanding network analysis. I mean, really understanding blockchain and trying to understand the value and creating all kinds of valuation metrics, risk metrics, signals, uh, etc. I'm also working on a DAO uh, that, you know, which is a, the, the level on top of that. And on the security and, and my, the one that is kind of a, a bit of a long-term, but is very, very important, which is the, um, to create a secured ident digital identity, which is very, very crucial, especially when we move into the metaverse era. And uh, yeah, I'm also writing a few books, one on NFTs, one on DAO, and one on DeFi. So very busy. Yes, we know this. And we're wrapping up now. So this is really the last point. NF, ex an exchange for NFT. I've been doing some research on non-fungible to tokens and platforms to trade them. But are you envisioning a stock market for NFTs in the future or something that people take really seriously? Yes, but... Of course, it's going to happen because it has to be a secondary market. This is why we have, need to have the regulation in place. Uh, because at that point, an NFT will be considered a security. And this, I mean, at that point, we'll have the regulators and it has to be regulated. You can't just, you know, go away and um, buy and sell. I mean, it all depends on what exactly is considered. Is, are, you, are you selling just a piece of art and then it's not a security? Or are you selling a fraction in that piece of art? And that might fall under security as well. So there's all kinds of questions to be asked, but I can definitely see it going to that uh, in that um, uh, to that future. Yeah. You know, right, I, I was speaking to some prospective tech partners and they brought up the issue of regulation. And when you are an entrepreneur or a prospective entrepreneur, you really don't like to hear about regulations. <laughs> Yes, yeah, yeah. so like, when I like, when I'm speaking to academics about metaverse, I'm like, stop talking about regulations. Tell me how, how can I make money? That's what I want here. How can I make money? <laughs> yeah, you can make money, but you can still be compliant and make money. Yes, exactly. But but in the future, Dr. Ozier, I am predicting that the branding sector will be transformed. And I'm just going to share this idea. A time will come when a person will be treated as a security. So look at Kim Kardashian, for instance. Kim Kardashian yeah. could be... Why worth not? I mean, why not? I mean, we saw that already with uh, um, uh, Jennifer Lopez when she uh, insured her body parts. 
if you remember. Yeah, so look, look at Kim Kardashian. So I don't see any, of course you're going to do that. I mean, you can NFT yourself. Yes. And if people value you, they will pay for it. And you can be treated like shares or like, like shares. Yeah. Yeah, so that's yeah, what that's then, what I'm predicting. But, but again, if you want, but again, you say you don't like regulation. If you want it to be treated like shares, it's gonna be regulated. Yes, I can't have my cake and eat it. <laughs> you, no, I mean you can still make money and be compliant. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. Yes, but I have I have a lot to learn, and your advice is excellent. So I'm in the near future, I will be cons consulting you. We're going to do no business. Problem. All right. Okay. It was a pleasure speaking to you, Dr. Mara, Dr. Ozier. Bye. My pleasure. Thank you. Did you stop recording? Yes. So I'm I'm closing it, but it's it's been a bit slow. But you can close your video. Okay. So. Thank you so much and let me know how it went. Yes. All right. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.